Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Everyday Trader. Good to be with you once again on an interesting day in the market. Remember, we talked about that last time, Eric. Interesting. You mean it sincerely. I know I you do. mean it every, every we day. We had more interesting things happen this week. Amazing things. 10 for 1 stock splits. 10 for 1 stock splits. Yeah. That's yeah. Er, cool earnings, Fed minutes. Um, there's always something to be looking at. Um, we're in the midst of a, a thunderstorm watch, severe thunderstorm watch. And uh, we had horrible tornadoes in Iowa here just uh, over the past week. So heart goes out in prayers for those people who are affected. But just, and I know you're having internet issues too. So hopefully we get this recording done. We'll keep this one short. Um, there were a couple of things Greg and I wanted to share with the community. One of which was that we saw the Fed minutes come out this week. And I, I got some highlighted, some of the notes that I took from them. And yesterday we saw a very bearish move in the market, which was sort of delayed because it, it didn't correlate specifically with these notes. In fact, the notes were from the day before. So today's Friday. Yesterday, Thursday, we had this really big move down. And it's funny, I was listening to CNBC and you people talking bearish moves in the market. It's like, oh, it's one day. We And we hit an intraday high in the morning. We were at all-time highs on the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. And so NVIDIA had phenomenal earnings. People were taking um, taking earnings or taking profits. I, I, or I guess maybe before we go too far down here, what, what was your thought on, on that? Um, what what do you think was the reason? No, I, I agree. You know, financial media likes to grab onto whatever story they can to try to make sense of things. I I feel it was a little bit of a delayed response. Yesterday's sell-off again uh, was a little bit of a delayed response to the Fed minutes. I think the reason this delay happened is NVIDIA came out on the same day, literally just a couple of hours after we got the Fed minutes. Right. And blew us away with another massive earnings report. And and that's what everyone was looking forward to. NVIDIA has become, we've talked about that on this on this program a number of times. NVIDIA is the leader of the market right now with this AI surge that we're having. And so NVIDIA's earnings made everybody happy. We forgot, I think, at least for a couple hours that the Fed just came out and said that they may actually raise rates with their next move. Uh, and that they're not seeing an impact on inflation that they were hoping. Uh, but you know what? Today, we're getting it all back. So at, the, at least most of it, the Dow is not getting it all back. The Dow had a really bad day yesterday. Uh, Boeing added to that, but we won't go down that rabbit hole. Uh, I'm going to say big picture. The market um, is just trying to digest the Fed's next move and keep they keep pushing put the potential interest rate cut further and further out. In fact, I'm, you and I have said for a while that we agree that the next move may be to actually increase rates um, because the inflation is still a problem. It's not going away. Well, you know, I, I can only say so much <laughs> other than maybe I heard a voting member of the Fed say that <laughs> in a private conversation. Yeah. Not not explicitly, but I mean, not like, oh, we're going to raise rates, but hey, it's possible. And that's... Um, you know, we talked about this on the Everyday Trader a few weeks ago. We like to listen to Powell and pay a lot of attention to that because the market pays attention to it. But the the minutes that came out from the April meeting uh, that were released two o'clock Eastern time on uh, Wednesday, the market didn't really react. I was surprised because there are clearly some words to 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 concern the market. One, you know, unease, which is obvious that. Um, unease over adequate protection from controlling inflation. And so that, that was noted across the, all the committee members and um, that their current high rates may not be sufficiently uh, restrictive. And then this one was the kapow was, you know, we may need to keep rates for higher for longer, but various participants mentioned a willingness to tighten policy further should inflation materialize. What that means is, raise rates. I and mean, that's, that's tightening policy. And that was, um, you know, if, if inflation doesn't get under control, we start seeing reemergence of inflation. That's what the Fed's going to have to do. And I don't want it to happen. But, let's, let's be honest, Eric, Let, let's be honest. The people that you talk to and who are, who are making financial decisions, and it can be on any spectrum of the, the wealth spectrum, the only ones I see making 
the only portion of the spectrum making decisions that are restrictive are the, the, the portion of the financial spectrum that are actually impacted significantly by the increase in grocery prices and gas prices. The lower end consumer right now is really struggling and they're having to take on more credit card debt. And you may see that part of the economy slowing down. But on the other end of the spectrum, where the bulk of the wealth is controlled to begin with, it's not restrictive, the, the 5.5% interest rate. It, it's just not. They're, they're still buying investments. You're still, you're still seeing uh, high-end stuff selling. You're still seeing I, – I just – I agree. I don't think that the – current policy rate is very restrictive. Now, it has at least slowed down some of the euphoria that was happening a couple of years ago. We don't have digital monkeys selling for, you know, $20 million anymore. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's not restrictive right now. I don't, I don't think it is. So will they have to go further I, is the big question. I don't know. We'll see. We did see a, a drop down in the Michigan consumer sentiment number. And I, I know that some people like to poke fun at this number, but um, I, the Fed looks at this number pretty closely because they, believe it or not, they they want to understand what the sentiment of people is are. are. They want to know how uh, people are feeling um, and how they're reacting because they are you know out of touch. I mean, they run in different circles than most people. And so they have to rely on these indicators and so they they do. I I mean I talk specifically to members of the Fed that, the, you know, what do you think of the Michigan Consumer Center? And they like it, even though it's it's not a huge, um, it it's one of the things. It's not not a big survey, but it's got a long history and it, and there's a lot of academic research that supports it. And so we did see a drop down, and this is mostly as you mentioned, it's the lower end of the economic spectrum, the people that are feeling uh, the pressure. Although we are getting some relief from gas prices, uh, but I think you know the the upper to middle middle upper upper people are are doing pretty well. And as our companies, we saw earnings come in very strong. We wrapped up earnings last week, so companies are doing really well. And I mean, certainly looking at the stock market, we're just off of all time highs just just the past couple of days. Uh, I'm I'm not looking uh, at a bearish trend. I don't think we've seen the top in this market yet. And by the way, I don't know if you follow Mike Wilson from Bank of America, but Mike is noted. I do. Me. He's a bull now. He's a bull now. So I think he's got 5,400 as his forecast. Now, there's still a few other ones that are out there. Um, oh, by the way, I'll throw a plug into uh, Barry's podcast. Um, Barry uh, Ridholtz from w Ridholtz Wealth Management. He... Uh, does masters in business, which is long form sort of podcast economics, deep dive. What I, what I wanted to throw out is this, um, is my, am I still sharing the screen or no? I don't know if I am. Yeah. yeah. Yep. This latest episode was Savita Subramarian from uh, bank of America. She's the uh, managing director and head of equity and quant strategies. This is one of the best podcasts I've listened to in a long time. I thought anyways, listening to, she runs a whole bunch of quant models. Bank of America has like 20 different models that they've been using for, for decades, looking at pricing. And, and one of the ones they use that I thought was pretty interesting is the bull bear indicator. And what that is, is it's, it's a contrarian indicator. They look at the wealth managers stock to bonds ratio. And so you hear the 60-40 thing, which is so six, put 60% of your, your assets in stocks and 40% in bonds. And that number changes, you know, 70% if you want, you know, we think, hey, there's more opportunity in stocks and maybe go the other way, 40-60 if you want to be more risk adverse. They aggregate those numbers. And Barry asked her what she, what she thought was the best model. She said this thing, and it's a contrarian indicator. So when, when, Wealth managers are advising their clients to have their highest allocation to stocks. That's the time to sell. And that's what this is. So that this is a measure of that. So we're, you know, on the high side here, but when, when you get everybody saying, don't buy stocks, that's the time to buy the stocks. 
So this is this is a bullish bear indicator from Bank of America. I would highly recommend listening to that podcast. It's a it's a really good episode. I I learned a lot from it. I think I'll go back and listen again. So Savita is a fantastic communicator. She speaks very very well, and Barry does a great job interviewing. I I like that one a lot. Yeah, I actually I like Savita as well. I've listened to her a number of times. She's uh, she's very bright. Um, yeah, definitely learned from that. So I I, I didn't. I have not seen that one, so I'm actually going to go watch it. I'll go find that. I like Barry. So, what were your thoughts then? Let's turn let's turn the page a little bit. What are your thoughts on uh, Nvidia and you know the massive earnings announcement that we got from them a couple of days ago? Uh, I was surprised. Um, I had expected uh, a big move but not that big um actually placed a actually I placed an iron condor which barely went in the money so I was able to close it for a little bit of a loss on that trade uh, so Australia strangle could have made money if you picked the right strikes and the uh, um the estimate um was was pretty insane in terms of the expected movement and it actually blew it away so um, this company's a juggernaut. There's there's no stopping it. So it's the way to go. Um, I'm still having a hard time jumping on to this thing right now at you know 1046. That's uh you know $105,000 to trade it. Uh so I'm glad about the stock split. And uh I, before we jump to that, what, what were your thoughts on the on Nvidia? You know, they're they're the main player, like I said, in the in the AI push. I'm not buying it at these levels either because sure they had 200 percent earnings growth, but good grief, it's a 2.6 trillion dollar company at, at this at this level. And there's people talking about a, a twenty five hundred dollar price target. I mean, that's a that's a six trillion dollar valuation if we get up there. I, I just I don't buy it that they're that big and we're going to kick the market, in my opinion, is treating NVIDIA right now as if 200% earnings growth quarter over quarter is going to last in perpetuity. And it's just not. It's going to hit a cap eventually. Where that cap is, I don't know. But it might be right now. It might be at 2000 a share. I don't know. I'm not trading it unless I did it in a collar, which is, goes to your point I think you're going to make right. with you know trading in a collar at uh, at a thousand dollars a share, you got to have a hundred grand. You're putting into just that one, just for a hundred shares. Right. So the the stock split will make it a little bit easier to trade. So let's let's talk about something that I've heard you talk about before in the past. Um, in about stock splits. So there's some sort of legends out there. There's rumors. There's facts. There's myths. Why don't you share your insight on stock splits? Okay. Well, fundamentally. A stock split doesn't do anything fundamentally. I mean, all it's doing is making more shares out of splitting the shares mathematically. It doesn't change the valuation, it, 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 but it creates an event that can, that can create some excitement, maybe reaching a, a target market uh, that's not normally reachable. And so as an example of what I was just walking through with NVIDIA where you know, to trade a hundred shares, if you want to do a covered call on NVIDIA to trade a hundred shares, you have to have a hundred thousand dollars buying power in your account to do that. And some of you may, and you may trade and own NVIDIA, but some of you may not. And there's a lot of the investing world that doesn't have a hundred thousand dollars that they want to put into one position. Um, and so being able to make that a smaller number does in some case increase the retail investors appetite for trading in a stock. Now, I know there's some of the fractal shares companies out there, the Robin Hoods of the world, the SoFi's, where you can go in and buy fractal shares. Their argument is, well, you can buy NVIDIA, you just are buying a little fractional share. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great, and that's true if you just are a stock owner. But if I actually want to start implementing option strategies, I have to have a minimum of 100 shares. And so I... You know, again, if I don't want to put $100,000 into NVIDIA, then I'm not going to trade it. Now, with it coming a 10 for 1 stock split, or even better, Chipotle, a 50 for 1 stock split, if I want to trade Chipotle's, you know, and, and I just haven't because it's a $3,000 a share company, it's now going to come into a range where 
I can put, you know, a $10,000 into owning NVIDIA or in, in Chipotle's case, after their 50 for one stock split, it's going to be a 60 ish dollar stock that now I can trade it with a $6,000 investment instead of a $300,000 investment that it would have required previously to, to do a, a covered call. So, so I, I, I like it. So we do have a couple other splits. So, um, Amphenols announced the split as well as Lamb Research has announced the split. So I'm, personally, I like these because they they put these back into the reach of, you know, my position sizing and portfolios where I can buy hundreds of shares rather than, you know, putting $105,000 or $300,000 into uh, Chipotle um, their positions I prefer not to take on. But the question I have for you, Greg, is does is a so the stock split, let's just be clear about it. If you take a pie and the pie is sliced into four pieces and then you cut it into 16 pieces, there's no extra pie. So the pie right. is the pie. And that's so we're just taking the number of shares. So at, by it's by splitting, there is no fundamental value, but there's sort of this urban legend that splitting shares is bullish for stocks. And what are your thoughts on that? So going back to the internet days, the internet bubble days, not the internet days, internet days. Um, going back to the internet bubble days, and what was really excited, and it seemed, the, it seemed like Microsoft had a two for one stock split about every six months um, back in those days. There was a pattern that if you were watching this a company's behavior around its split. That was pretty common. Now, it wasn't 100 percent like all patterns that you look at and try to identify in the market. But the pattern was is that when a company would announce a split, they would usually gap up with that announcement like NVIDIA did yesterday. Now, of course, the other reason why that usually happens is they're usually announcing their stock split on about the same day that they're announcing earnings. In fact, that's a very common thing that you do see is that the company will have an earnings announcement and at the same time, they announce the stock split. So we got this gap up. After that, so the time in between the announcement and the actual effective date of the split is the stock will usually trend just with the market, um, which generally is bullish, though it's not always the case. It's, it's usually just going to trend with the market. Then the, when the split actually occurs, Oftentimes you actually get a sell-off right after the right after the split. And for I, I don't know the reason why. I don't know if it's people who only want a certain number of shares in their account. Maybe you had a thousand shares of NVIDIA in your account. And now you have 10,000 shares of NVIDIA. And you're like, yeah, that's that's too many shares. I don't want that many shares or something. So they decide to sell some of it off. Most likely it's probably that it's people that we're in it earlier. They got the big gap up move. They thought, I'm going to hang on to it through the split. Then once the split occurs, there's just some selling pressure uh, that, that I think is nothing more than profit taking. The unique thing about that sell-off is it usually creates a pretty good buying opportunity because fund if you look back fundamentally at the stock split in itself, why did NVIDIA just announce a stock split? It's not. Why has NVIDIA's stock gone from $300 a share to $1,000 a share in the last six months. Well, it's because the company's doing really well. And just because the company announced a 10 for one stock split and is all of a sudden trading at a lower level, doesn't mean that Meta and Amazon and everybody else in the world who's trying to build their own AI farms right now, they're not still buying processor chips from NVIDIA. They are for now. And so a lot of times the, the sell-off that just comes from market dynamics of people taking a little profit taking does actually create a decent buying opportunity that over the next 30 days to 90 days, the stock will actually have a really good bullish performance short term. Now, that's usually short term lived and then it comes back to, okay, now you got to prove to me you're still making money. Well, I did a little bit of research here to look at some recent splits. So over the past couple of years, some big names, Walmart, Walmart, a monster, Nova Nordisk, Celsius, Amazon, Alphabet, and Tesla have had splits um, just over the past couple of years. And what I wanted to do was look at from the date, the announcement of the split to the date 
that the split was effective. And then looking at one week, one month, three months later, and looking at those numbers here. So we got seven here and two underperformed and four overperformed after the announcement. A week later, um, the uh, they were more down than up. And a month later, maybe 50-50, Three months later, we got more separation, but you, then you got to ask the question, how did the market do? And I looked at this with both the S the S&P 500 and the Qs. So this is how the S&P 500 performed. And this is the difference. So if it's positive, it outperformed the market. If it's negative, it underperformed the market. And what I'm telling you is I'm not coming away with any sort of smoke and gun. Um, underperformed the market for four or th three of these and pretty significantly uh we did have some outperforms here but of course there's some other things going on in here like this bottom one here is tesla so tesla being down 37 percent more than the market three months later that was probably elon doing something crazy i think he bought twitter oh yeah that might have been it that was probably, <laughs> about that time and so yeah it was around that time so I, I'm not seeing any sort of tradable opportunity as far as bullish or bearish goes. But for me, the opportunity, and this is another study that was done by Goldman Sachs, and that was after major announcements, covered calls tend to do very well because the catalyst is expected, the catalyst happens. And I happen to like the idea of in the money covered calls because it gives you a pretty good protection to the downside. And people are, what do you mean in money covered calls? Yeah, you're going to sell your stock. But you're looking at making, you know, on an annualized basis, 20 to 30 percent with really high probability of doing that. I think these are fantastic opportunities. In fact, I think you and I were talking ahead of time. I I like for Nvidia. I like the idea of a Costanza trade. That is the uh, doing a bear call uh, because I I think that's probably what we're likely to see. Now, bullish adjustment would be buying the stock, and then you're in a very bullish trade. And I, I don't know. I think that might be the strategy from here. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, though it is quite a juggernaut looking at uh, NVIDIA doing a bearish trade here is going to take some cojones. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it, we're still in the bubble. Uh, to, 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 it's the bubble is not finished inflating yet. There's still liquidity out there uh, that is chasing stocks. It's chasing homes. It's chasing gold. Uh, it's chasing Bitcoin, Ethereum. There, there's still liquidity out there. And I, I still believe the Fed is not in a super restrictive phase of their monetary stance. So I'm, my big picture bearishness is still there. I do believe when the liquidity evaporates that we will have a significant pullback. But right now the, the liquidity is still there. So the market uh, keeps grinding higher. Well, all right, man. I'm going to wrap things up then because I got to get okay. going. And uh, hopefully this short one was uh, people enjoyed it. And again, leave us feedback, like, and subscribe. We appreciate it and send us your questions. Thanks, everybody. See you See on the you. next one.